So I want to welcome you to tonight's episode of Anomalies. Uh, I'm Dan Hall, one of your uh, hosts, and with me, of course, is my uh, partner in crime, Dave Jinx. But we are very fortunate to have with us tonight a very special guest, Tiago. And is, Tiago, say your last name so I don't screw that up. Is it Chichet? What, say it again, please. Chichetchi. Chichetchi, okay. Yeah. So Tiago, um, the reason we're talking with him is that he is in Brazil and is a ufologist who has studied the UFO phenomena in Brazil. And uh, I've always had an interest in a couple of Brazilian cases, and he agreed to talk about uh, those two cases. And he's written a book, and you can talk about your book. So let's let's start with the 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 basic question: How did you get interested in UFOs? Well, basic questions is always the base the basic answer. Well, I think I was born with ufology in my blood. Really? Uh, you really? Because since I was a kid, uh, when I start to read, I read uh, comic books like Spider-Man, Captain America, X-Men, uh -huh. that, and magazines about UFO. Here in Brazil, we had and still have the Revista UFO magazine, and uh, I start to read it. And uh, today, I'm I'm the co-editor of the, this magazine. So you went from reading it to editing it, huh? Cool. And now I'm I'm, I'm joined the, the the magazine, and uh, my father my father was a, a Brazilian Air Force pilot. Ah, yeah. And uh, he loved the subject. He never seen nothing during this his duty, but uh, he loved the the subject, and he encouraged me very much to get deeper in this in this matter. Okay, so it's just kind of a natural thing that came out of your childhood, reading about UFOs. Have you ever seen a UFO? Yes. Uh, you, want, you want to I talk saw, a little bit about that? Yeah, I was eight years old, uh, and it was in 1982. I live in, in Rio de Janeiro, and I live in a, in a neighborhood called Barra da Tijuca. Well... We, we were playing, me and my friends, we were playing, uh, and I saw a, a red light descending from the sky. And this light stopped it and started to hover over a mountain here, there in Rio, that we call Pedra da Gavia. And suddenly, uh, this light disappeared. It's okay, it's a balloon, oh, let's see. Uh, moments later, uh, this light became, uh, reappeared and, and became bigger and brighter, a, a, a very bright red. And uh, this light made a, this, this movement, a erratic movement, and then speed away in, in the sky's direction. Well, I was eight years old, but... Uh, I, I live it most part of my life when I was a kid in uh, Air Force bases. So I, I, I saw helicopters and airplanes every single day. So I knew, even I was a child, I knew what was a helicopter, a balloon, or, or an airplane. Yeah, you and knew uh, that. I'm sure, I'm sure that that was not. Yeah, that red light was not the conventional aircraft. No, no, not at all. Hmm. And then uh, when I moved to Brasilia, I I was 19, 19 years old, and uh, I start in a, I start to participate in a group here, a political group here in Brasilia, and then I it was 22, 23 years ago. <laughs> and I start to to research ufology. Uh -huh. So no, uh, you and I share something. Uh, I'm a member of MUFON. You are too, as well. Yeah. Have, have you ever been a field investigator for MUFON? Yes. Yeah, yes. I have too. Uh, I'm That's what I do. I'm yeah. Yeah, and Dave has written a book on UFOs, so we're kind of deep in the subject. Um, 
tell, tell us a little bit about your book that you just finished. Well, uh, this book has more than 500 pages and more than 300 photos and illustrations about UFOs. And the cover more than a hundred cases in, in, in Brazilian ufology begins pre-1930s. And I choose the best cases with more evidence and more photos and more information to put in this book. So it begins in uh, pre-1930s and then goes to decades of the, the 40, 40, 40 decade, uh, 50 decade and until 2017. And I try to put all the best cases that I know, and many of these cases are unknown in, in, in the English language. Yeah, I bet. So many of these cases will be a very good surprise to the readers. Tell us what the name of your book is and how we could purchase it here. Uh, the book is called uh, UFO Contacts in Brazil. Okay. You can, you can buy it in a, in a Kindle format or in a, on a paperback format. And Amazon.com. Yeah, Amazon.com. Right, yeah, Thiago Chiquetti or UFO Contacts in Brazil, and you'll find the book. Okay, cool. Uh, now, uh, there are a couple of those cases, and like I said, there are probably many more cases <clears throat> that you're familiar with that I am not. <clears throat> Excuse me. But talk about the two cases I'm familiar with that I know a little bit about. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, would be the Antonio Villas Boyas. Antonio uh, Villas Boyas. Yeah, the the first one of the first abduction cases I ever heard about, and then yeah. the other the other case I'm kind of interested in is the Vargina uh, UFO case. So tell us, what could you tell us about those two uh, cases? Well, Antonio Villas Boyas happened in 1957. Antonio Villas Boyas was a farm. And he was working in a farm uh, during the night because during the day it was so hot that practically it was impossible to work. And uh, he was uh, in a tractor uh, in a field and he saw a star-like light coming and crossing his head, over his head, several times until that this, this light uh, landed in, he realized that it was, was not a, a, a star, it was a spaceship. And came from that spaceship, uh, three figures, three entities, uh, wearing a uh, tight clothes like, uh, like a diver, with a helmet and tubes linked in, the, in their backs, backpacks. And uh, they took uh, forced, forced Antonio Villabos inside the, that uh, UFO, the spaceship, and they put him in a in a in a in a in a room without nothing, just a clear room, mm -hmm. and they <clears throat> took off his clothes, and they started to wash him with a sponge, with oil on it. And they use the sponge and they, they put some uh, something in his chin that suck his blood, a little of his blood. And they left the, the room. And Antonio noticed that in the room there's a, a kind of a bed. And suddenly appeared a, a, a beautiful woman, you know, blonde, blonde and a small woman, but very similar to a, to a, to a human woman. Uh -huh. And for some reason, he was very afraid, but at the same time, he got very, very excited. <laughs> he, he, he doesn't, he, uh, he didn't know if it was because this pond of the oil or the situation or because the, that female was naked. Yeah. But they had sex <laughs> for, for uh, a couple of times. And uh, at the end of the, the relationship, uh, they asked her, he asked her, uh, where, where did she come from? And uh, she didn't say nothing. She, it, during the sex, she speaks some kind of grooming, grooming uh, uh, words that he can understand. And uh, when he asked her, where she, did she come from? 
she pointed his belly and pointed to the sky. Antonio uh, thought that she was telling that she came from the sky and then they were going to have a baby that's going to be from the sky uh, as well. And then uh, Antonio Bravo never, sorry, had any other contact like that or a logical contact. He became a, a, a lawyer. And since he since that day until he his death, he claimed that what he saw was real, and uh, for many times he had to repeat his story and never change a word. So, so uh, I believe that was the first great abduction uh, case, much before uh, then uh, the hills. Yeah, Betty Barney Hill. Hill. Uh -huh. It was in '65 that got all the notice and got the, the press. But Antonio Villalobos happened almost uh, 10, 10 years before it. So, is he a credible? Is his story credible, Tiago? Do you think? It is. It is. It is. What, may, it what is. makes it credible? Well, in my my opinion, well, of course, I, I didn't study the case, but I, I read many papers and books about it. Uh, Antonio Villalobos was a, a very, very simple person. Very simple person. Uh, in Brazil, uh, we call a rustic person. Yeah, a person that okay. is in, 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 in inside country of the country of the country. And uh, he never wanted any money, any publicity of that. And he had no reason to lie, to tell something like that. In, in, in 1957, you know, in Brazil, uh, UFO was not that that uh, subject. Today, you can you can you cannot always trust in some kind of of, of report. But back at that time, if the person said he was abducted by aliens, at least he's gonna be sent to a hospital. Mm -hmm. And uh, he didn't want it. He just told it. Uh, to his family, and then he told it to a closer friends, and then this history, his history, got to, to a Brazilian Society of Flying Saucer Research, and they interviewed the Antonio Villas Boas, and uh, and uh, sent to to United States and other language countries that uh, could know about the case. Now, it seems like I saw, of course, it's a YouTube video, so <clears throat> I'm not so sure how accurate it would be, but <clears throat> did he suffer radiation poisoning uh, because of this contact? Did he become ill? No, this is a Virginia case. Oh, that's the Virginia case. Yeah, okay. Virginia case. One of the soldiers that captured one of the creatures. Well, let, let's start Virginia from the beginning. Okay, yeah, okay. Uh, Virginia happened in 1996, in May of 1996, when a UFO crashed in the city of Virginia. It's a city of Minas Gerais state. And uh, four, creature, four creatures, two alive and two dead, were captured by the Brazilian army and Brazil in, in Virginia fire, firefighters. Uh, one of these creatures was saw by three girls in the in the in the landscape. They saw the creature crash it and in a wall. The girls thought it was uh, a devil because he was the creature was so ugly. It was a brown, a brown skin color, had the two red eyes and like three horns in his head and uh, in the head some kind, kind of a sulfur smell, just like devil. Uh, some people say the devil had some kind of sulf sulfur uh, smell. And the, the girls run to the uh, house and ask to, to their moms, their mom. And they, when they return to the place, the creature was not there. But the army, and police and the firefighters of the city of Virginia was already run away to capture this creature. As far as we know, uh, the Brazilian 
Air Force and the Brazilian government and Brazilian army was warned by NORAD that the flying saucer, that the object, uh, just got into atmosphere and they're gonna be and gonna hit the Virginia city. Well, so they were prepared. Uh, two Brazilian army soldiers captured one of the creature. One of the soldiers was named Cherez, and uh, he touched the creature without gloves, without any protection. And two days later, he touched the creature. He became ill, very, very ill. And he went to a hospital. And then the next day, he was dead. Oh. Well, doctors didn't know. Until now, they didn't know what happened to him. Uh, because he got a, a, a very severe infection. And the misery was so deep uh, that he was buried in a lead coffee. Why? To not contaminate the soil. Mm. Well, if it was just an infection, uh, uh, several, a uh, uh, severe infection, why he would be buried in a, in a, in a leaf coffee? Yeah, that's interesting. So the family just got his obituary report last year, almost huh. 25 years later. Why did that and take so long? We don't know. We don't know. They they had to ask to the to the to the judge, a judge of, of Virginia, to they had to go to, to the law to ask to the release this report and they didn't give it an answer that why they they kept it for so long but in the report was said well Shiraz was dead because uh uh unknown uh infection that we never know here in in, in brazil mm. and the family tried to unbury it and make some uh, exams of the body but was denied by the law. So can I cut in here, Thiago? Um, I'm sure you're familiar with the different structures, intelligence agencies, the apparatus in the United States yep. and Brazil. Do you see in your investigations that the structures are similar in terms of uh, secrecy? In, in this case, the classification systems, maybe, was this classified by the government? No. Is there any no. indication of that is, is, is why the information was withheld or uh, concealed? Or was there just never any determination of what, no, what uh, happened? Uh, no, the, the Brazilian government never gave much attention about ufology. Mm -hmm. uh, UFO cases. Uh, we have, we have. A, when I'm, when I mean, when I mean, we have. A, I mean, the government, Brazilian government, has uh, a lot of our, our uh, and others, uh, another uh, problems like political problems, economic problems. That ufology is not one of them. It's not something that they they will concern about. Mm -hmm. uh, that's so. That's so true. That we send to United States the UFO crash in Virginia and the four aliens. We know that. We know that because a week later of the event, a huge uh, airplane from United States landed in Virginia Airport. The Virginia Airport is a very small airport. And on board of this uh, airplane was militaries from United States and personnel from NASA. Mm. So is it and, probable? Uh, yeah, is and we know that. That, that that the U.S. is a proxy, or Brazil and other maybe smaller nations without as many resources have outsourced to the United States. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that influence from the U.S. seems to 
at least in my you know investigations obviously it doesn't take long before you realize how influential the united states is in the ufo uh, phenomenon so there is evidence that the ufo stepped in early in this case as they frequently do yeah, yeah. and and the, the, the coincidence i'd say the coincidence is that uh after we 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 gave the the ufo crash and the, the entities some time later the first brazilian astronaut went to the, to the space by uh, invitation of the U.S. government. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we exchange a UFO and four bodies of aliens right. for a ticket to ride to space. Uh, what a deal. Yeah, what a what deal. A deal. Oh, what a very... <laughs> well, let, let me, I know we're, we've got, we could talk for six hours, I'm sure. I just wanted to bring up one other case that I'm interested in personally, Linda Moulton Howe has done a pretty extensive uh, analysis and description of the, uh, let me see, Filippo Bra Felipe Bronco? Or no, no, that's the, the business. It's uh, Urandir Oliveira? Urandir? Urandir Oliveira. Yes. Do you, can you talk about that case? Well, what what I'm going to say is not good because Orange is a charlatan. Okay. He's a very, very dangerous person that treat the the people that uh, tells that he was stealing something from people. And they did. He was arrested uh, several years ago by charlatans. Mm -hmm. uh, for for Quakery, and uh, well, I don't know why Linda got this subject because here in Brazil, Urandi is not a very good person seen by by ufology. He's not credible. He never contributed with nothing, and when he he started uh, in ufology. In his uh, private, uh, in his pro property uh, in, in, in Mato Grosso do Sul, back in the 90s, he used laser points, pens with laser points, to fake uh, alien probes mm -hmm. in, in trees, in, in rocks, in the sky. So he's not a very readable person. And, and he, he alleged uh, or claimed to have been abducted himself, right? It's a lie. He claimed. He claimed. Yeah, he he's claimed, lying. but, yeah. he claimed, but it's a lie. I, that, I, that I, I know a very famous photo that, uh, he, uh, of, of a sheet that right. was burning like a, a person laid it and burning in, in a surrounded the 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 person he's a great liar i we don't we don't have to give me any kind of publicity and not, i'm not saying that because oh i'm, I'm jealous about him no i'm not i, I don't care I, I i really don't 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 well, care what to say but he's uh uh faking things Mm -hmm. to to make people give him money it was a, a rather elaborate fake too it looks like with the uh the burned bed sheets as you mentioned and then the burn marks in the ceiling and the story that goes with it oh, I, had, I, I read that a number of years ago and never heard any follow-up but your uh opinion your your um conclusion is that it's uh, it was a hoax and not worth. It's a hoax. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Everything's a hoax. Uh, uh, some time later, some time, some some years ago, he made a he made a a, a video when uh, he was claiming that he had contact with an alien named Bilu. Mm -hmm. Bilu. Name of the alien was Bilu. B I L U. Bilu. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, one of um, one of the TV uh, network here in Brazil went there to to film this ET because he told that the ET going to be there to be interviewed by this TV crew. And this TV crew, uh, well, the interview should be at night with no lights. The thing that, well, mm -hmm. began, began strange. Interview with, in, in the middle of the wood uh, with no lights. Okay. But this crew brought a uh, not, uh, natural vision camera, night vision camera. Mm -hmm. And when they start to film, Urandir was wearing a glass with two lights in a corner of the glasses. And was, he was singing with, a, yeah, with a, a child voice to pretend to be an alien. Mm -hmm. And uh, But the crew saw it because he was using a, a night vision camera. Okay. And he was covered. He was covered in a, in a jacket, and used a glass with lights in the in the side of the glasses. So, how can you trust in a person like that? Well, true. And as you well know, this is a very complicated and uh, frequently a baffling phenomenon that sometimes doesn't seem to make sense. Do you have cases that you've looked at where? It appears that there's a legitimate interaction with the witness, but he, as in this case, does something to uh, participates in a hoax or some uh, goes crazy in some some way, so that it really even further complicates the situation where you have a genuine contact, maybe or some genuine. Uh, uh, you know, witness of something unusual, and and then it's immediately corrupted or complicated that way. And I see you uh, nodding your head. You you know what I'm talking about? How complicated it can be, and what do you attribute that complication to? Do you attribute it to intentional misinformation sometimes by, say, the U.S. government or intelligence uh, apparatus? Or is it something more fundamental that's in the consciousness that humans just can't handle, uh, you know, the, this, these kinds of observations? Oh, uh, there's a lot of cases that, that the beginning was genuine. A lot of cases. One of, one of the, I have one in my book, the Karan abduction. Mm -hmm. uh, that the both, uh, they were, a couple was abducted several times, and when this abduction is stopped, they begin to fake information, to fake abductions, to to trying to stay in in in, in the lights. I mean, they 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 trying to perpetuate their fifteen minutes of fame. Mm -hmm. This is very common, very common. If the people want. To get some advantage, advantage, advantage of uh, his experience, this is the way he, they will go. Right. I'm, not, I'm not saying that Uranji had some real case. I don't think so. Yeah. I, I think he was a liar from the beginning. But the yeah. current case that in my book, they start with their genuine abduction. And they were abduction for four, five, five, four or five times. And then when the abduction stopped, they lost all the, the publicity. They lost all the, the, the lights on them. Right. They got divorced as well. And each one trying to keep the fame. So it's very, very normal. Unfortunately, it's very normal. And it, it really does complicate the job of... Uh, investigators, researchers trying to keep everything straight. That's what I find about this is so frustrating. But also I mentioned the other aspect and that is potentially, well, we know for sure this happens in certain cases where the, the misinformation, the disinformation of 
particularly the U.S., but I think it goes on in, in Europe, uh, where intelligence agencies, there's so many of them in the U.S. alone, I think we have 18 different uh, intelligence agencies whose job is to deceive. I mean, that's, re that's their job. And so they step in sometimes. What is your opinion on how influential those entities are in this, uh, this subject? Very, very big. Very big. And it's uh, mostly the United States, I would think. Who else do you see as being playing a very big role in the misinformation? Well, nowadays I think the, the United States is the biggest place that the agencies do it. I don't see Europe like, well, United Kingdom or, or France, maybe, but the rest of the world, right. uh, Russia, maybe Russia or China, they're yeah. big, they're, they're, they're great, uh, uh, big countries of very potential arm, armies. Uh, they do it to keep the secret and to keep the, the people uh, aware that uh, if they if they s say something that the government didn't don't agree, there will be consequences, wow. and the agents are there uh, to confuse uh, the media, to confuse uh, uh, the witnesses, the threat, the witnesses, and to make the witness like a, a, a jerk in front of everybody. So if you have some kind, if you have some kind of experience, why do you go to, to, the, to the TV or get publicity if the agents comes to you and gonna target you as a, a, a jerk or a, 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 a loony? So it's very complicated. Yes. Um, what about, uh, I guess this is related to UFOs, although I guess there's a, a disagreement about what the cause is. What about cattle mutilations or animal mutilations in Brazil? Is that something that's common or is that, uh, have you ever run across any of those cases in your investigations? We never had any, any kind, case of uh, animal mutilation in Brazil. Hmm. Like like uh, 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 cows or, or horses. We had some case of Allegedly, uh, chupacabras. Oh, chupacabras, yeah. Yes, in the beginning of the 2000s, and stop it. Uh, and I investigate one of these cases. I investigate one of them. It's very, it's very curious because you can find what, what cause of the the, the cause of the death of this this. Uh, in my case, of duckies. But in Brazil, we don't have cattle mutilation. We we last year we had a lot of cattle mutilation, cattle mutilation, in Argentina, uh -huh. in Rosario, in Buenos Aires, in Santa Fe. We had many cases of that, but in Brazil, amazingly, uh, we we didn't have any cases. I don't know why. Yeah. I really don't know why because Brazil, as you're gonna see in my book, Brazil has all types of UFO subject. You have abduction, you have contact. We have sightings, we have crash, we have everything, but we don't have any any case that, as far as I know, about cattle mutilation. Mm -hmm. What What are your theories? And I guess they just have to be theories because we don't know the answer for sure. What are your theories about where UFOs come from? And maybe there's no one destination. Maybe there it could be time travelers. They could be any. So, what do you think about that? Well, uh, we we are. We have a, a, a full of theories. I this is my eleventh book. One of my other books uh, was about uh, alien typology, and I made a research of eight years about uh, of reports and the witnesses and and cases, and I found it that at least we had seven two types of different aliens. Really recorded in our reports during all the years, during our, our history. Uh, why, but in, in none, of, none of 
any in none of uh, any of cases i found the origin of this this aliens no one knows where they come from uh maybe they are they are us from future maybe they are from under sea under 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 earth i don't know my my opinion i think they come from another planet they have some kind of technology that uh that he they can be able to travel in space. I think that this is the most simple theory about the, the aliens visiting visitors. Uh, but there's a lot of theories. I think that they came from another planet, several other planets, because I we had at least in my research at least 72 types of aliens, very different between them. Because we in uh, in, uh, in our planet, uh, we are different. Well, Asian is different from uh, Africans, it's different from uh, South America, but we're the same. Two legs, two arms, <sighs> two eyes. So we have this the same the same body construction. And these seventy two types of aliens, they are very different from each other. So if you if if you want a very, very, let's say, very base, they are from set from uh, different seventy-two planets. But they do generally share characteristics of humans, right? I mean, you're talking about insectoid. Yes, they're insect-like, but you don't see creatures with six legs or eight legs or eight eyes very much. I know there's some some reports but in yeah. general they're very humanoid which does suggest a, uh, you know a set of assumptions you could make um in that somehow we're related if if you're stuck in the physical reality you know as soon as you allow for a a, a different realm you know, potentially that they travel through and, and if they live in the realm of consciousness or whatever, you know, shape shifting, all of that, you could be whatever shape you want. So, I mean, that opens up a bunch of different possibilities. Yeah, yeah. General, the 72 you have to keep types, your mind open. The 72 types are mostly humanoid, I would think. You don't have slimes, you don't have, you know, elephants or whatever. <laughs> It's no, like you you do life. you do have slime. You do have uh, types of uh, uh, six legs, but the most of them, of yeah. course, the most they are like us. Like us, I mean, for two uh, two, two two arms, uh, two legs. Some have four fingers, three fingers, five same fingers. Some have one eye, three eyes. Well, well but ex the ex structure mm -hmm. is basically the same overwhelmingly they're humanoid at least from what i've um what i've read and so do you focus on you know there's a whole spectrum of close encounters do you focus on the close encounters of the fourth kind of the fifth kind in your research for the most part uh i know when i wrote my book i was i'll admit it i was very hesitant to go into the close encounters of the fourth and fifth kind because that opens a whole new realm Again, like I said, consciousness, um, time travel, entity, beings who are supreme or powerful. You know, I wanted to stick with nuts and bolts, metal saucers and whatever we, we used to believe up until maybe the 60s or 70s in general. And then we started to consider some of these other uh, you know, some of these other realms or these other possibilities. You focus on the any particular area of that spectrum today? Yeah, yeah. Uh, to write my book, the, the typology of aliens, my focus was the, the, the fourth and fifty kinds of contacts, of course. Yeah. Because uh, I, I, I must have the, mo the most detailed possible to describe the creature, to describe his, the details, and then uh, divide and catalogize any any kind of of this of these beings. Uh, to write the book UFO Contacts in Brazil, my focus was the best cases that we had in Brazilian UFO literature 
and references to bring all the informations to uh, the English uh, language. But as I said, you wrote a book as well. To know what was all, how looks uh, looks like the, these aliens, and it was terrifying as well. <laughs> you had to research 40, 50 kind of uh, of encounters. It was terrifying. Sometimes I, I had to 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 write late at night, so I was alone in my <laughs> office, <laughs> reading oh, it, oh, yeah, <laughs> looking back, <laughs> looking back all the around. time. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, and and that is a perfect, uh, you know, example of why it's it seems so abhorrent is, is the word that comes to mind. It is so scary because if any of these reports are true, and I think the three of us believe with all of our hearts that they are, many of them are, then you have to admit that humans are much further down the, uh, the evolutionary chain or the, this cosmic ladder where several rungs down from these beings, at least in a lot of different aspects. But why are they so interested in us, or are they interested in us? Do we just perceive that to be true, or, or do humans at least uh, have some aspect that is very desirable to these other beings, or are we just a zoo and it's a curiosity to other intelligences? Well, this is a, a million answer. It's, right. it's difficult to, know, to, to, to tell you. Uh, sometimes, I say that we are like uh, lab rats, mm -hmm. and people doesn't like it. Doesn't <laughs> like it, but it's true. It's true. Uh, they are not here to destroy us, in my no. opinion, because they would do it if they wanted. Yeah, we w probably would have been destroyed quite a while ago. Yeah, yeah. they want. They, they are not here to save us. No, because if they want, if they would do it, uh, they would give us the cure of AIDS, cancer, uh -huh. natural, natural disaster, they're going to warn us. Well, uh, I think they are here to study us of some type of study analysis or just to know a, a, a different planets of them. Because to write that book about the alien typology, a lot of uh, type of aliens was just uh, just appeared in some some period of time. They are not they are not reported anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, the the beings that was reported in Venezuela in 19, 1952, they were very they were hairy, small, stronger, and they try, and they fought with a uh, 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 troop driver in Venezuela. And uh, they were re reported only in nineteen. 52 to 1954 and never reported again. Mm. What we have now, it's the grays. The grays are all in all places and the insectoids. And some people say that the, the lizards, they are here, but we don't see uh, like a flatwood monster. It was never reported before, again, after, yeah. after that, that, that case. Oh. And yeah, we have a lot strange. of cases of that. That's a strange looking ca uh, creature, the Flatwood the Monsters case. I, I've, I, I teach a UFO class and I've used that creature as a, an example of, um, you know, something that people have experienced. Um, I was going to ask you one other question. Are, are you familiar with the uh, concept of Sasquatch or Bigfoot? Yeah. Is there anything like that, any creature like that ever reported in Brazil? Well, we have in a, in a Brazilian folklore, yeah. We have in Brazilian folklore. Yeah, a uh, uh, being named Curupira. He lives in the woods. He protects the animals in the woods. He was very hairy. He's not bigger and larger as a Sasquatch. Mm -hmm. but he looks like an animal as well. And uh, many people said in the folklore that this the Curupira always appear after they saw a bright light in the sky. Ah. Mm -hmm. So we can have some connection here. I'm not, I'm not saying that the Kurupira is the, the, the Sasquatch or the Bigfoot. But uh, we can relate it 
this the curupira of the, this strange light all the the brazilian folklore if you look at if you study it very deeply uh you can make this link with ufology in my uh, MUFON field investigators handbook, they have different kinds of entities listed. And one of those entities looks a hell of a lot like a Sasquatch. So there's a connect, there's that connection you're talking about between UFOs and Sasquatches. So how are we doing for time here? Are we, are we doing okay for, for time with you? Do you need to? Uh... To me, it's okay. Okay, it's okay. Well, you, well, he's got about f five to ten minutes, I think it sounds like. Okay. In order to not be late, so let 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 let's wait. My wife yelling. <laughs> <laughs> We've had wives. We, we don't we don't want them yelling at you. Um, <laughs> what else? Uh, so, one question: We interviewed a lady from France, uh, Marie Muller, and she's uh, had multiple contacts throughout her life. She's seen. Uh, um, UFOs, she's uh, an experiencer, and one of the things she said that I thought was kind of interesting, she said, in France, the culture is such so that you can't really talk about UFOs. She doesn't have anybody to, to talk about her experience, experiences with. So in Brazil, how, how do, culturally, how are people treated? Uh, how is the topic of UFO, uh, ufology treated? And also, um, how how do people, if they have experiences, strange experiences, do they have support groups that they can go talk about those experiences? Yeah, well, Brazil is is Brazil is a, a, a multicultural uh, country. We have people from all over the world. We we are made uh, we are made by people from all over the world to talk about uh, ufology here. It's not big, it's not a trouble. You can talk. Many gonna believe in you uh, and and agree with you is most important. Of course, you're gonna have a person that gonna say that we're crazy, <laughs> but uh, that's a, that's not the majority. And uh, but the, the subject never was taken so very serious. The last thing that was treated or published in, in TV here in Brazil about ufology was the Tic Tac and Nimitz right. that happened in the United States. That was the last time that we had a big TV uh, uh, network, television, telling something about UFO. Uh, besides that, you can talk freely with anyone, there's no problem. We have support groups uh, as MUFON. I'm part of MUFON, of course. We have support group in uh, with MUFON. And then we have also support group of Brazilian Commission of Ufologies. I'm president of CBU, Brazilian uh, Commission of Ufologies. And we have uh, professionals, medical doctors that help people that claim to be abducted and claim to have some implants under the skin. Uh, or people that just want to get uh, an answer of their question, of their experience. Mm -hmm. So we, we do have, but, but Brazil is so big. Of course, United States is bigger than Brazil. But Brazil is so big. But Brazil doesn't have uh, the advanced communication that the United States have. Uh, and I said, you, you, you can live in the middle of, of, in, of Arizona, New Mexico, you're going to have internet. You're going to have uh, the, the minimum to communicate. We have in Brazil, in the north, north of Brazil, in a, in a inside country of Brazil, there are places, there's no light. Mm -hmm. They use uh, fireplaces, they use candles. And in that places, we have huge numbers of sightings. Ah. Outside. And that became so common that people doesn't bother anymore. They see it, they see a, a flying disc in the sky, but okay, I saw it yesterday, I saw it last week, I'm gonna see it tomorrow. They will not report. It's, it's, it's no it's big deal. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, it's not a big deal. Yeah. So it, does that, it's not for them. Tiago, so does, that, sorry. does that imply to you then that um, th these aliens, for lack of a better word, these intelligences, uh, that, that they prefer to still operate in isolated areas, in the dark, so to speak, well, literally, sometimes in, usually in the dark, uh, is that a, a part of a selective um, exposure program still that seems to have been going on for a century or more? Is that kind of how the these alien, aliens work still? Yeah, I, I'm sure that they don't, want, they, they don't want to appear. If they do, they're going to land in the garden of the White House. They want... They don't want to be seen. And what does that imply? Sure. What does that imply to you about their intentions? Understanding, of course, that there may be several races with different intentions, but this particular one who's doing selective contact, what does that imply to you about their motivation? Well, uh, they they come they come to to a plan to do what they have to do and leave. We had, in 1977, in Brazil, uh, an invasion. It was an invasion. Mm -hmm. And in my books, call it the plate operation, Operação Prato. From November to 1997, 1977, to January of 1978, several cities of north of Brazil, like Colares, like uh, Belém, like some of uh, very remote seats. They were attacked by lights in the sky that like shot in the, the, the residents of the cities, uh, kind of laser beam, they sucked their bloody. Ah. Their blood. Mm -hmm. uh, many of these, peop these people uh, went to the hospital and the doctor in the hospital, there was only one doctor, a female. Beslaidi was her name. And uh, she saw that the person that was attacked by that light uh, had anemia. They lost blood cells. Mm -hmm. So what that, what those aliens want to do, we don't know. The episode was so, so, so critical many cities uh, turned it like uh, ghost cities because the people left the city. Really? And, uh, yeah, and the mayor of the, of, the, of the cities asked the Brazilian force to send a crew to investigate it because it's something in the air. They didn't know that it was a plane or a helicopter or what else. And the uh, Brazilian uh, Air Force sent a crew uh, headed by, back at the time, Captain Holanda, and they start to investigate all uh, the cases and investigate and uh, the witnesses. And they took more than 200 of photos of UFOs. They had, they filmed more than, more than 25 hours of UFOs in the sky. They filmed in eight millimeters camera. Mm. And they had more than 5,000 of reports Right. And uh, in one in one in one event, Captain Holanda stood just ten meters meters of an alien being. He almost touched the alien being. He was a, a, a captain of Brazilian Air Force, mm -hmm. and it was that that episode was witnessed by other four militaries. Mm. So, what they are here, what they did at. We don't know. We don't know. When Holanda, Captain Holanda, had uh, got back to the headquarters of the Air Force in, in Parai State, his officer, his commander, told him that, well, the investigation is closed. I said, well, but now we've got almost in contact with them. We have a lot of proof. And he said, well, it's an order, superior order. We have to quit all the investigation. Years later, we knew, uh, we got knowledge that 
after Brazil stopped the investigation, the United States came to Brazil and began his own investigation that got from 78 to 82, the Warden Air Force Rainforest in Amazonia, in Pará, investigation, the Chupa Chupa phenomenon. So why they are here? We don't know. Uh, I don't know why they are here. Uh, not they are, I don't think they want to conquer us or destroy us or save us. They are here for their own agenda, and we still don't know what is it. Well, isn't it amazing that such a, uh, a widespread and ongoing uh, encounter like the one you just described can somehow not uh, can be can be held secret, you know, because Dan and I, we, I don't, I, I hadn't heard of that. No, I, I had read, either. I may have read in passing that there was a flap or a wave in Brazil in 1977, whatever the dates were. But Bob Pratt wrote a book about it. Bob Pratt. Yeah. Who for danger zone? Who for danger zone in Brazil? And and you've given me lots of books, uh, including your your own library of books that I'm going to add to my personal library after we, I'm going to get on Amazon and get some books. But the fact that we have to go find a book to read about it, isn't that sort of mind boggling? And that reminds me of the uh, the case in Zimbabwe, the aerial, aerial school, right? that's coming up hopefully in the next couple months, I believe. I'm really looking forward to that documentary. But when you have multiple, multiple witnesses, dozens, or in this case, it sounds like hundreds or thousands, and you have all this 